And she said, no, Melissa, she's going to have to get a phone and she's going to have to have social media because that's where all the friends are. So here's the doctor. Here's the prescription we use. All of our friends are on this anxiety medication for social media anxiety. And I'm looking at her like, are you kidding me? May, you may trust your fifth grader and you may tell them, don't click on this and don't do this. And, and, and they're going to be like, okay, mommy, I won't. But honey, let me tell you, when they hit 15, they are going to use screens very differently. I have a 16 year old, they have a smartphone, they have social media, they play video games. Like where do I even begin? I mean, I can't just go in and take it all away, can I? What do I do? Welcome to the Minimal Mom Podcast. Dawn reaches a million women each month with practical tips to simplify your home. Today, Dawn is joined by Melanie Hempy from Screen Strong. Melanie helps parents prevent screen addiction after she saw the devastating effects of video game addiction in her oldest son. Melanie uses her nursing degree and brain science to educate families about the dangers of screen overuse. Well, welcome to the Minimal Mom podcast YouTube channel. I know there's been a little confusion. Um, so I we do have a separate podcast YouTube channel. That's what you're on right now. I would love if you subscribe to it. It just helps us reach more women with the message of simple living. But also, I have been so humbled by the quality guests that I've been able to visit with um, over the last few months. And today I'm joined by Melanie. Uh, I'm super excited to visit with Melanie. Super high quality <laughs> conversation I know that we're going to have. And so, um, Melanie, I've been following you guys on Instagram for a while. Your Instagram account is be screen strong. And you you provide such great information for moms and parents and families trying to navigate the digital world with our kids. And we were visiting a little bit before we started about, I said, here's the deal. I don't want to put more guilt and shame on moms because we've, we're, we're drowning in that. We have enough. So can we have a conversation today that is all about how can I, how can I become one step better? If here's where I'm at with my kids and screens, how can we bring it up a notch? And ultimately, what's our ultimate goal? But for today right here, what can just be some clear next steps that we can take to, to make sure our kids are having the best childhood possible really is what it comes down to. So first, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got interested in this topic, and then we'll start talking about some really practical things that we can do as parents. Yeah, I love that question. You're asking me how I got interested. Well, I'll be honest with you. I was forced into being interested <laughs> about this topic because we basically did two experiments um, in our home. I'm a nurse, graduated from Emory University. I have all this medical knowledge in my head. And boy, I thought I had this child raising thing down, right? And so our first experiment was with our firstborn child, my son, Adam, and he became addicted to video games right under my nose and in my house. And ultimately because of me, because I provided the access for his video games. And so um, all through middle school, he started dropping out of all his activities, you know, baseball and guitar and piano and all the things he used to love. And he started playing a lot more video games. And at the time, you know, in culture back then, uh, we were being told, like on all of the people like you, uh, you know, wonderful advice about how we should not overschedule our kids. So I thought, oh, well, if he wants to quit baseball and he wants to quit all these things that are getting kind of hard for him in middle school, then by all means, I mean, uh, you know, the newspaper says, you yes. know, back then when we used to read the newspaper, <laughs> um, you know, the Dear Abby, whatever, it said, yeah, let him quit, right? Mm -hmm. Because they need downtime. Well, little did I know that he was spending all of his downtime on his screen, which at the time I thought still was okay, because certainly... Don, they wouldn't invent a, something that would hurt my kid, right? Yeah, I mean, right. video games, you know, if you were a boy, you played video games. It was just like if you were a girl, maybe you did ballet. I mean, it was just the, the same. But anyway, kind of long story short, and that could be a whole nother show for another day about what happened in our home. But he went to college and dropped out his first year. And see, he was, he had straight A's all through high school. So that was the trick that tricked my brain into thinking that he was okay. He was not okay. We had a lot of stress in our home during these years. In fact, if you're listening today and you have a gamer living in your house who's a little bit out of control, you know exactly what I mean. There is so much conflict when you have a uh, gamer who's dependent on their video game because they just can't engage in 
real life, you know, Adam, come to dinner. Adam, come to your sister's birthday party upstairs. Adam, come to Christmas, right? They don't, they start choosing the virtual world instead of the real world. And that's where the conflict comes in. So when he went to college, we were so happy because he was in the engineering department. He was super smart. Like I said, straight A's. I totally missed it. I totally missed all the signs. I picked him up. And when I was driving him home, there was something wrong with him. Like immediately I knew, and I, I thought he was on drugs because it looked like a drug addiction from what my background was. Wow. And he, he said, mom, I'm not on drugs. That video game did something to me. I've been in bed for a week. I haven't gotten up. I haven't showered. I haven't eaten. I haven't done anything. In fact, he did not finish his classes, Don. It was horrible. Wow. So I drove home. I remember on the highway thinking now all these years of pain and conflict and confusion have finally making sense that there is something wrong with these video games. So then I started traveling all over the country to all my friends who were neuroscientists and doctors and all the pediatricians and the conferences. And you know what, even back then in 2010 and 12, this was a thing, right? And, and it was just starting to get out there about screen addiction and I didn't know anything about it. So um, there was a chemical uh, reaction that's going on when your kids are on their screen, whether it's a, a video game or whether it's a phone, there's a lot of dopamine released, right? A lot of cortisol. There's a lot of neurochemicals involved. And so parents, if you can listen to this and understand that this is a chemical thing, like, and once I understood that, I never would have allowed what was happening in our house when he was in, in middle school and high school. Had I known that it was an addiction, like a chemical, like gambling, like, like drugs, alcohol, like it's almost like you allowing him to drink at night or something like unknowingly, obviously, but that's as far as our brains, that's kind of a similar thing that was going on. Right. And so I just didn't know. Yeah. And back then, even 20 years ago, we didn't know as much about this stuff, right? When I was in nursing school. And so I was yeah. so like blown away by the science around screen dependency and screen addictions and what the long-term effects are. And so for Adam, we ended up, um, he came home and he wasn't going to go back to school. And so I did what every good mom does. And I, when you have an 18 year old in a hoodie on your sofa playing video games, what do you do? You call the military. Okay. <laughs> so they came to my door, the recruiter came and they recruited my son into the army. And I am telling you at the time, it was the very best thing we ever did. He got 14 weeks of a screen detox called basic training. <laughs> and little did I know, but that was resetting his brain. And that's what we do today and all across the country. There's treatment centers for this. You know, you can pay a lot of money or you can enlist in the army <laughs> and get your 14-week <laughs> digital <laughs> detox. So, uh, so at the time, he was like, yeah, I love Call of Duty. I love to shoot guns. And the recruiter said, we're going to teach you how to shoot guns. And interestingly enough, he was a sharpshooter. He, because video games train uh, classically and operantly, they train soldiers to shoot very well. So he was a great uh, shooter. That's a whole nother thing. Um, but he ended up going to Iraq and he served our country and he came back and he did finish college. And so we're very proud of Adam. And he speaks for us now around the country. And he says, mom, you have got to tell as many parents as you can what happened to me. So the same thing won't happen to them. And it just makes me super emotional when I think about his attitude toward this now, because I tell him, Adam, you've saved so many kids and including your brothers and your little sister. And so um, the second experiment that we did and oh, and by the way, I will just add that Adam did um, actually just finish law school last year and he's an attorney. Now. Okay. So you didn't ruin his brain forever. Not forever. But let me tell you, it was because he got this detox, at least when he was 18. But I will tell you what has been uh, ruined, I guess, is his childhood. I mean, there, I'll, I'll just be real frank. Um, the, the difference between Adam and my younger kids is their memories, their childhood, their connection to our family is so different. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But um if you don't fix it every day that goes by, you know, gets worse and worse and worse. And so with Adam, it's as if, you know, you know a lot about addiction. And so we know that when a person gets addicted, their developmental process kind of stops yeah. at that stage. Mm -hmm. And you have to go back 
and fix it, right? So that's why you have a lot of people in their 30s that got addicted to alcohol when they were in their teens and they have to go back and kind of refix some things, you know, because they didn't learn it, right? And so Adam actually has a lot of scars. There's, um, like I said, a lot of pain around just this blank slate for his childhood because he didn't really have a real connected, fun childhood. Um, and that's, you know, you think they're having fun on their game and they're not. It's very stressful. It's an extremely different um, form of play than we think of playing out in the backyard. So so um, the second experiment that we did, that experiment did not go very well <laughs> when I just allowed Adam to get immersed in video games. And I tried to set limits. I was the game cop mom. You know, I set the kitchen timer all the time. We did all that and and we still got really burned. And because moderation doesn't really work with certain addictive activities. And so um, with the little kids, my daughter was next and I have twin boys that were younger. And I thought, okay, I, we are not doing video games again. I obviously uh, did not do that very well. And um, so with my daughter, when she hit middle school, I started asking some of the older moms, it, you know, that I was around who had high school kids. And I just said, what did you do about phones? And um, they said, okay, well, you know, she's going to have to get a phone at least by eighth grade. And so they would give me, I, I wish I had the card that, um, that mom, the first conversation I had about this, she gave me the card of the physician that all the moms used to get medication for their daughters because they were on social media. And I'll never forget this. I was in a, in a ball field. I was on the stadium watching a baseball game. And this mom talked to me for the whole game. And she said, no, Melissa, she's going to have to get a phone and she's going to have to have social media because that's where all the friends are. So here's the doctor. Here's the prescription we use. All of our friends are on this anxiety medication for social media anxiety. And I'm looking at her like, are you kidding me? I, I am not going to get my daughter something that I have to to get her drugs for right. so she can do it. And I thought, oh, do we give anxiety medication to our kids that are playing Legos too much? You know, no. <laughs> and so Melanie, what year was this then? And this was back in 2015 okay. and wow. 16. And these, um, these moms were, they were just nonchalant about it. It was like, this is what you do. They, they have social media depression but all the counselors say they have to learn how to use it. So they have to be on it. So they have to have medication and here's the doctor and this is what we all do. And this is like the club. And I'm like, okay, we're not doing that. Um, and I had been burned just enough the first go around to realize I'm not doing this again. And, um, and as a result of everything that I went through with Adam, we started screen strong because I started talking to parents in schools and different groups. And I realized it's not just me. I thought I was the only one. I thought Adam was the only one. And it's a very shameful thing. And it's a very guilty thing as a parent. You feel like, oh my gosh, my son has this temper that I, you know, he just punched the wall in and he's throwing things because he gets really angry at his game. Or, you know, my 14 year old's having a meltdown on my kitchen floor because I took Fortnite away or, right. you know, but you know what? You're not alone. This is very common. It's a very common you know, reaction to screen overuse. And so I, at that point in time, Don, I was already out talking uh, to groups about the science behind what's going on in their brains. And it's, it's not them. They're not bad kids. No, you know, it, they don't mean to, it, they are being caught up in the persuasive design and it's all designed to pull our, um, our dopamine chemicals up really high and to get us hooked. And so when this mom was telling me this about the phone, because we, Adam didn't have a smartphone and I was never going to give him one. And then when my daughter, you know, came along, she's a girl, right? So it's a little different than you're thinking social media. And this mom, I will just never forget that. And so I thought, well, I'm going to wait till she's 16 at least. And so I went to lunch um, when she was six, right around the time she turned 16 with some friends, I went to lunch and they said, what are you getting Melissa for her birthday? And for her 16th birthday, and I said, well, I guess I, I think I need to give her a smartphone. I mean, we've waited this long and boy, did they give me heck. And they said, whatever you do, don't you dare get her a smartphone in social media. And they started telling me just really horrible stories. And some of them really weren't horrible, but they just weren't good about what their daughters were doing on social media because it's not all bad. But, you know, going into the bathroom and taking pictures of yourself in the mirror with your 
leg up to show somebody your socks. And then you got your whole crotch in this thing. And, you know, the moms were like, Melanie, it was the worst parenting decision we ever made. And if we had to go back, we would never give our kids, our daughters, you know, social media and a smartphone. So I told her, I, I took that to heart and um, Melissa got a pair of boots for her 16th birthday. <laughs> and she did not get a, yeah. smart, she had a flip phone. Okay. She was fine. Yeah. I am. I, I know you talk about this every day. I am feeling my stress level go up just to hearing these oh, no. stories. And I think I'm sometimes a little insulated because our kids are nine through 14. We homeschool and I think I'm a little insulated from what many parents experience um, if your kids go to school and the pressures that you face as a parent and your kids are facing. So I, I definitely want to talk about first person shooter games and that kind of thing, because I know that is something that gets a lot of attention now too. But let's let's kind of break it up in age groups. Let's start with the the younger kids. So if I'm a mom with younger kids and then we're gonna work our way up. And again, if you've you're like, I've already ruined it. I've we have we have video games, we have smartphones. Like I know Melanie has great great advice for you too. So we're gonna work our way up. So if I am a mom and I have newborn through five year olds in my house right now, what paint a picture of kind of like what would be your best case scenario for us? And then we'll kind of work backwards to for us to work up to that. So for the little kids, the American Academy of Pediatrics has very clear recommendations on basically virtually no screen time. I mean, you know, um, because of their, the way their brains are developing, um, it's there's so much I could say about this and the whole topic of TV and all that. We are not an anti-screen organization at all. And we understand there are some things that are good for education, but you you should never use it a screen as a babysitter during that age. Um, so think about this for that age: attachment, touch, and movement. So you're thinking ATM. That's easy to remember when we used to have ATMs. <laughs> um, so attachment, touch, and movement. That's what your kids need at that age. A ton of that. They need to move a lot, and they need lots of touch. That means with all their toys and all the tactile stuff that they're doing. And um, you know, the attachment to you is the most important thing. So that doesn't happen on a screen. So you can use an iPad if you're going to call your mom and you want to FaceTime somebody. Uh, maybe you're looking up a recipe about how to make, you know, um, some kind of cupcakes or, you know, just some kind of something for your kids. But you really don't want to use screen time as um, a babysitter. And uh, what we recommend instead is music. And so you can play music in your house and that stimulates your child when they're young and then they dance and they play and get them really used to fun music and even books on tape. Like they can listen to all these things. It's the visual stimulation that is so hard for their little brains. And in the new book that we just um, put out for kids, we actually, oh, I'm so excited. We have a preschool version of this book coming out in a few months for preschoolers where you can explain what screens are doing to them. Yeah. And it's so wonderful. Yeah. I think it's important to understand that the games and the visual things on the phone and the tablet that you might be letting your kids watch when you're just trying to like get through the grocery store, or occupy their time, that they are meant, like they are designed to be highly addictive, that the creators of these things that are targeted to our kids that go on our tablets and our phones, they know how quickly to change the screen, how much flashing goes on. And so it's it's different than when we were kids growing up watching cartoons on Saturday morning. And so if I'm not ready to like totally pull the the iPads away and, and give them my phone or to go screen free I, for these younger, is it better to have a show on the TV than something that they're holding directly in front of their face? Yeah. And you have to be really careful about the show they have on TV. And so what we know now about this, exactly what you're talking about with the stimulation, with the rapid movement of the screen and the rapid movement of even like SpongeBob SquarePants, that's the example, because that's like the worst um, there's so many screen changes every second that that's stimulating their brain in a way that makes them very stressed. And it makes them have ADHD symptoms when they don't have ADHD. It's called acquired ADHD. And this goes on through the younger years. But what I recommend is you find a series like, honestly, like Little House on the Prairie, The Brady Bunch. I don't know. Find it, uh, you know, leave it to Beaver. I mean, whatever. Find a slower paced show and get the DVD set. Yeah. And I said yeah. that. I'm telling you, if you don't have a DVD player, go to the Goodwill and get one because there's no commercials. And and then it stops. 
So, you know, that's the best thing that you can do. And this is a recommendation we get from all of our doctors. That's totally what we did. And we had, uh, because I knew I'm lazy when it comes to managing screen time. Sure. Me too. I, and I'm, I'm a failure. I yeah. Failed. So that's where I'm like, if we have DVDs, I don't have to like, and the DVDs, the book of DVDs is all like approved by me. I don't have to manage anything. And so we would have, like, we got the box set of like full house and home improvement. Although in the later years, there were some topics that would come up and I had to pull those DVDs out. But the earlier seasons were pretty, you know, slower paced. And it was so amazing. Like the kids would put one on and within like five minutes, they would just be playing again. I know. Often they'd watch it for a few minutes. You know, maybe if someone's <laughs> sick, then they watch it longer. So a lot of times, but be, again, because it was not the fast movement. Now, and we never had like dish or anything, cable at our house, but we'd go to my parents' house and th they'd have the regular shows on. And I'm, no, no shade to my mom. My mom is fantastic. But like you said, SpongeBob, SquarePants, I mean, the kids would just be mesmerized by the TV. And so it was very interesting that I could see that difference just in the different programs that they were watching. Yes. It's a big difference. And there's a reason for that. And because they are mimicking, they have mirror neurons. If you put on Power Rangers, they're going to be jumping up and down and kicking and screaming and hitting their friends. If you put on Barney, they're going to be dancing in a little circle. So your kids do exactly what is on the screen. But you know, you may say, well, what about us? We were fine with cartoons and whatever. And we had Saturday morning cartoons. Yeah, we were fine because guess what? Those things stopped after 30 minutes and then we were gone. We were outside playing. There were very small doses of it. But now the kids and parents, and I was just as guilty as this of it, as any parent, you know, you just put it on in the background kind of because it just kind of entertains your kids while you can go about your day. And so many moms now work out of the house and they have other children they're trying to take care of. But I will tell you right now, you pay now or you pay later, there will be a huge payment. And when you pay now, the cost is very, very small to get your kids interested in non-screen activities now will pave their way just your life will be so different. Um, you're, you're, you won't have this fighting. Imagine never having a conflict over screen time in your house. Yeah. I mean, just think about that. Mm -hmm. Think what I just said. Imagine never having a conflict. After we figured out what we had messed up with and changed everything, that's how our home was. We never had a conflict. We, never, we, ar we argued with Adam all the time. And then we went from that to we never had an argument. They, we never had an argument about screen time. I, I know I can just keep repeating that. It was just so beautiful. So with the boys, when they were about in third grade is when all this was happening. And I realized, um, you know, wait a minute, you're, we're not doing this again. I mean, I totally screwed up. And by the way, if you're listening, I just want you to take a deep breath. I have made more mistakes than everyone out there listening. So I don't want anybody to feel bad. You can at least feel better knowing that you have not made as many mistakes as I have. And how long, Melanie, if we're, if we're if like, okay, like, I, yeah, I mess this up with my little kids. I give them a phone anytime we go out in public, basically, so they'll just be quiet so I can get through my things. How long does it generally take for kids to kind of detox if we're like, okay, I'm going to pull it. I'm going to just, I'm, I know there's going to be some battles. Um, I know I had a mom the other day cause, cause I talk about too, if you highly simplify your kids environment, their toys, everything, they get very overwhelmed when there's too many, like don't go out and buy more toys. Now that's not at all what we're saying. They actually thrive in like very simplified spaces. But the mom said, Hey, I did this. We simplified the toys. It's, it's good a lot of the times, but they'd still rather be on the iPad. Yes, because the iPad is the cocaine, right? So don't expect that now they're going to just choose toys or to not have it. Like they're still going to ask and we just have to be strong with that. But how long does it take to, to detox? So it does, depending on how immersed they have been, it will, you know, it'll take them longer, but it can be anywhere from a month to 90 days. It could even be two weeks if they're not that immersed. But what you just said, you're exactly right. It is like cocaine. You have to think of this as a drug because it is a drug. And if you know anything about dopamine, whether you have dopamine from your screen or from cocaine, it is exactly the same dopamine. People don't understand that drugs of, of abuse block our dopamine receptors and then our brain makes more dopamine. We all get high on our own supply. So people don't understand okay. that. They think yeah. it's actually a chemical yeah. coming in, but with a game and, and with a screen, it's the same dopamine, right? So it's the dopamine, whether it's cocaine, whether it's a screen and it's, it's all the same. So once parents understand that, it really helps. And so what I think it, it's about, honestly, we have been doing this for so long with parents and we have a 
we have like a little week long detox that we do in the middle schools for kids to, to get off all their stuff for a week and they write an essay and whatever. And then we have like our um, 60 day or our 30 day detox and there's 90 days is what you want. You really want a full 90 days, but let me tell you what you do with that. Cause whenever you are going to pull something away from your kids, you have to replace it. It is 100% your job to do that. It's not their job. Their kids, you, you have now like, like I did with Adam, I, I kind of stunted his ability to like things, other things. And that was my fault. hundred percent. Again, I, I'm going to own that. And I think guilt and shame is um, appropriate. Sometime it's the only way it's, it's like pain. If you touch the stove and, and we didn't get a pain from being, you know, we'd burn our hand off. Right. So, so there's a, there's a reason why we have that gut feeling that something isn't right. I could tell you in a nutshell, really quickly for little kids for like zero to five years old, one of the best things you can do is, Honestly, make a little photo album just with real pictures that you stick in your purse. So everywhere you go, you can pull that out and they can, they mm -hmm. love to look at pictures of themselves. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be their little screen time. It's going to be, and there's so many cute ones you can get for little kids, you know, that they can chew on, but um, that's really good. Always have a book in your purse. Always have colors with you everywhere you go at the grocery store, at the whatever doctor's office, wherever you are. Put your screen. I have mine in this little portfolio thing where you can just close it. This is one of the best things I ever did because it's kind of closed. So it's it's harder to like see. And so that's really good. Um, music is in the car. You want to play music. You want to put books on tape. You have to think of things to replace. And this is what we teach a lot on our site and through our parent course because we have a parent course. And, and it's not that hard. And the other thing I will say to invest in is like a trampoline with a net around it, something outside in your backyard, start investing in things in your yard that they can play with, you know, the basketball hoops, all different sizes. Think of physical activities um, and think about the money that you're going to spend there versus the money you're going to spend on counseling. So I have this, I have this formula and I say, well, if it doesn't cost as much as a counseling visit, then you can get it. You know, <laughs> so, um, the moms, oh my gosh, the moms that are doing this are like, oh, this is so great. Cause now our, our kids, we have so many fun things at our house yeah. now. Yeah. So definitely think about that for that age. And of course that's true. Um, for that age, usually it only takes a couple weeks. Sometimes it's really not that long and they may have a fit and a meltdown and you're going to smile and you're not going to get upset. And you're going to say, honey, I'm so sorry. Mom made a mistake. I thought this was okay for you and it's not, but look, we can do this instead. Yeah. And they want to spend time with you more than anything. Yes. So if you're going to try to do a detox, then you need to take probably some time off work and spend some time one-on-one -on -one with them and be sure that you do not use screen time as a reward in your house. Never, never use screen time as a reward. You want to use things that you value most as the rewards in your house. And that's time with someone else in the family. So in our house, our rewards for our, our younger kids growing up was usually time with dad, you know, camping in the backyard on a Saturday if they did this X, Y, Z, or maybe they went out to get frozen yogurt with him. Yeah. It was all the big deal yeah. to do that kind of thing. I love that. And so, I mean, I'm sure now as parents too, we're thinking, well, if my kids detox, that probably means I'm doing a detox along the way too, because I can't have my phone in my face and then be expecting them not to. But hopefully this conversation too is helping us as parents to understand our own addictions to our phone too. Yeah. And I never want mom to feel bad about that. Look, you are the parent. The kids are not the parent. And so the best tip I have for parents is to start parenting like a coach and quit this whole best friend. I want my kids to like me thing. That's never going to work. And so you are the parent. You do have a screen. You do have a phone. You have a job. You have a life. And you are not asking your kids to do anything that you didn't do. You didn't have a phone when you were 10 years old, right? So you're not asking them to do anything that you haven't done. And it's all going to hinge on your attitude. Promise me. I mean, I will promise you. And you have to promise me that you will not get on that roller coaster with your kids. You can't be upset when they look at you with those big old brown eyes and are begging you, you know, when they're in fifth grade for that phone. And they may even have a PowerPoint presentation all ready to go. <laughs> yeah. And those girls will do this. And I, I actually put this slide in my presentation because so many families, their, their kids are doing this. And I'm like, well, start saving money for them to be an attorney, but they do not need a phone and you need to smile <laughs> really good because your kids are not mature. And so 
that's one of the, the biggest things that if we can just touch on that one more minute about the science behind your kids' brains right now, because if you understand the science, even just a little bit, you're going to just take the biggest sigh of relief. It's going to make so much sense. Don, the reason why our culture is so confused about this is because they don't understand the science, if that yeah. makes sense. Well, because everything else has been regulated, right? Drugs, we can't give our kids drugs and alcohol right now, right? Like you have to be 21 to drink. But but we're behind on the cell phone. Like this current generation is the big experiment like you've been talking about. Will it get to a point where it's regulated? I don't know. But no one is telling us giving your kid a cell phone is the same as giving them a drink, right? And so we're not looking at it the same way. No, and let me tell you what else it does in a nutshell, because I know we don't have like hours and hours here. So what I need to tell you is not only is it like dopamine, where it's paving their brain for future addiction. Okay, get that into your head because, you know, one addiction leads to another addiction. And this is the problem. When they get used to this high level of dopamine, then nothing in life is going to match that. And Adam has a wonderful video explaining this, but nothing in life is going to match that. So nothing else is going to be fun anymore. They're going to miss all these uh, natural things that, you know, rites of passages that kids should be doing in childhood because it's just not fun. Why would you want to go jump on a trampoline when you can play Fortnite? Like, come on, you know? And so the problem is during adolescence and as they come up through their puberty years and through adolescence, the brain has just millions upon millions of neural connections, right? And then the brain is sitting there thinking, okay, what activities are we going to do? Because those are the connections we're going to keep. And the, the activities, you know, that we don't do, like, you know, get pruned away. The, the neural connections that we don't use get pruned away. If I had known that one fact, it would have changed everything for me with Adam. I did not understand. I thought when he was like 15 years old, he was taller than me. He had a little mustache. I thought, oh, he's done. Like, I'm done. Like, he's an adult, you know you know, this neuronal connection and all these pathways getting paved in your kid's brain, that doesn't finish fully until they're 25. So the frontal cortex is not developed. It's the last thing to develop. The back of the brain develops first, and that's the movement center. That's why your kids have to move a ton every day for that part of their brain to get developed. If that doesn't get developed right, nothing else is going to get developed right. You have to move a lot. I mean, a ton. I mean, I have all the stuff in my course about how much, but the kids, your kids have to move a ton every day. Then the limbic area around, around middle school, around puberty, that limbic area, the middle of the brain starts to get developed. Well, that's the reward center, right? So it's a little backwards because we're developing the reward center. We're developing the accelerator mm -hmm. before the brakes. The brakes is the front <laughs> of the Okay. And that is the judgment center. Okay. So this, that in a nutshell is the problem. Our kids' brains are not ready yet for adult screen technologies and things like the video games they're playing today. Those are not designed for kids. And the uh, social media and smartphones were never designed for kids, much less teenagers. Yeah. Well, let's move up then. Let's talk about the uh, like six to 12 year olds. Is there any place for screens in this age group? Right. So for six to 12 years old, again, it's kind of the same thing. You want to structure your values and what you enjoy as a family together. So we uh, absolutely promote watching sports and baseball and football and basketball and getting get following a team is really fun as a family so you can have super bowl parties at your house and so it's all the different sports now of course you don't want to do that every day in our house the rule was the screen could never be on if the sun was out first of all so that was a big thing oh the sun's out sorry you know you can't you know and and i didn't have i wasn't the screen police like I was the game cop with Adam, you know, with the younger boys. What happens is when you get them into these other hobbies and all these other interests with music and collecting baseball cards and painting on rocks and being outside. Oh my goodness. My younger kids love to be outside. Adam does to this day, not like to be outside those parts of his brain. He just never grew up with that appreciation for nature. And that is a gift that your kids need their whole rest of their life. So for that age group, you can have a 
family movie night on Friday. And you pick, I mean, there are so many wonderful family movies. We have so many, uh, you know, that we recommend. Um, and so that will take them all the way through, <laughs> you know, their middle school and high school years. We would, even during COVID, we started doing this and we keep doing it, is we put a big sheet outside under our deck and we have a little projector. They're really cheap and we have movies outside. And so all the neighborhood kids will come over and they're, you know, just when they, and this is so funny, even when they were in high school, they're like, mom, let's watch Cars again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was one of their favorite movies. So, you know, some of the Disney movies are fine. And, um, but it's just not our main thing. And, and that during that age, you have to be sure that their screen doesn't become their main thing. It's not all bad. But there, the thing that what is bad, Dawn? Okay, so this is really important. The screen use that is bad is we call it toxic screen use. And these are the screens you have the most problems with. So the toxic screen use is video games, social media, and pornography. Those are the three things that you, as the mom and as the head coach, you and dad, you know, I, I always say one's like a catcher, one's like the pitcher. You know, you need both of them. <laughs> but, um, but you're the coach. And those are the three things that you've got to steer away from. Now, my kids know everything about all the video games because their friends play and whatever. And they know about social media because their friends are on it. But they did not have it. And we believe and we believe based on the science and based on the psychology of the most healthy way to build a young brain is to talk about these things. But you don't do them just like you talk about alcohol, but your kids don't have to drink in order for you to teach them about alcohol. They don't have to do drugs in order for you to teach them about drugs. They don't have to be on social media to learn about social media and the different things. Totally. Social media was never designed for them. Well, it is a marketing tool. And I think that's the fear. And, you know, we run into this, especially homeschooling is like, oh, well, you don't want to raise your kids under a rock. And then, you know, like now they're just oblivious and they're going to go into the world. And like that has not been, they know everything. If anything, our 14 year old is like, I see my friends on Instagram and I see them always taking selfies and they are so like obsessed and about getting the right picture and, you know what they're putting out into the world now. Your kids are going to be way more independent if they do not have a phone and if they do not have video games. They will be way more independent than you can ever imagine than the kids who have those things because those things are highly immersive. They're very addictive. It's very difficult, in fact, impossible to do anything else while you're on your phone or on your video game. So they're wasting all this time. It's 16,000 hours between middle school and high school that kids are spending on devices. 16,000 hours? So you think about what you could do with 16,000 hours. Well, both of my kids took, you know, uh, the younger ones took piano lessons and violin lessons, and they were in sports kind of year round and they did whatever. And we, yeah, they were scheduled, but they just had a lot of fun things that they're still now enjoying right now. So you, you cannot worry about uh, that. They're not going to be prepared. You cannot worry that they're going to be left out. They're going to be left out of all the right things. And they're going to become leaders because you have to be different in order to be a leader. You have to get comfortable being different. And what I know that was really hard for me, because with Adam, it was really easy, Don. He was just downstairs in my basement. Like I knew where he was. You know, he wasn't drinking. All my girlfriends said, oh, at least he's not getting drunk and he's not getting anybody pregnant. And I thought, oh, that's the bar. Like, yeah. is that the bar? Like, It's pretty low. Right. Mm -hmm. But I didn't understand that I was keeping him safe. When your kids are on screens, you are helicoptering them. You are hovering. You know where they are. They're on their screens. They're in your basement. They're safe. They're on their phone. You're tracking them. You're watching them. You're, you're following all their social. You're the helicopter mom. It's just the opposite of what you think. When my little kids didn't have a phone, do you know how hard it was for me to let them when they were in fourth grade, get on their bike. They rode their bike to go get their hair cut for the first time. And and the people in our little downtown area called me, Melanie, do you know Andrew and Evan are here by themselves on their bike? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, and it's scaring me to death. But you know what? I, 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 this is what we're doing. Yeah. And they figured it out. And that and they are so independent. Well, and they're and almost, you know, too independent. <laughs> yeah. I, I saw a thing that said, you know, it's actually safer to send your kids to the park unattended than to let them on a screen unattended. Would you agree with that? 
Absolutely. This is where all the predators are. I see it every day on my podcast, the Screen Strong Families podcast that we have, and we bring them all on and we talk and we want to, we just want to warn parents. And I, I just want to tell parents like everything I wish I had known. And it's not about feeling guilty. You've got to immediately get rid of that feeling. And we cannot ever parent out of fear. See, we, you know, I was so worried. Well, if Adam didn't have this, he wouldn't have any friends. And and he had to have this and whatever. And I was so worried about what might happen. And then when I figured it out that I kind of screwed it all up and did it wrong and I did it differently, you know, with Melissa and the boys, I, I just thought I'm not going to worry about what might happen in a month or even a year. I'm going to parent right now for what I know is best for today. This is what's best for them today. And I know that a lot of people have questions about, oh, no, well, is their brain already damaged and, you know, they've already seen porn and they've whatever. And what I want to tell you is, no, their brain isn't damaged. However, some doctors would agree or they would argue with based off of the MRI findings that we're having through all the major studies that are happening, that there are certain parts of your kid's brain that are going to be damaged. I mean, if you okay. don't fix it, you okay. know, but our brain is very plastic and we can, we can heal them. So if your kid has already been immersed they're already playing Fortnite, begging you every day for three hours. Maybe your daughter has been on social media and she has already seen something. I remember that feeling of just like, oh, well, it's over. I'm done, whatever. And I want to tell you, absolutely not. Every day that goes by, you can heal them. They can grow. They can. The brain has an amazing capacity to heal itself, but it's now is the day. You can't keep letting it happen. A lot of parents really worry, Don, about when their kids see porn. It's like, oh, well, the ship has sailed and now they've seen. No, no. Every image is cumulative. And so for our boys, if they saw something when they were in middle school or, or high school, you know, we would ask them. And in our in our new book, in our parent course, we have a wonderful chapter on this for the kids to understand about pornography. But we'd ask them. And they would talk about it and we would talk about what they saw. And our goal was to have a porn free, you know, day the next day or, yeah. you know, you, okay. sometimes you keep a chart. How many days have we gone without seeing a questionable image? Because these images are permanent in our kids' brains. The images are permanent and that's why they're cumulative. And this is why we can't cry over the spilled milk. We have to do better when we understand the science. We have to take off our parenting hat and put on our coach's hat. And we have to think, okay, what would I do if my team was losing? I'm going to go back to the basics. We're going to get rid of all this crazy game plan that we have. And we're going to have a new game plan. It's going to be really simple. And it's going to include these basic things. And we're going to spend time with our kids. We're going to help them get over this dependency that, that we caused. I was really mad at Adam all the time. And I'm so kind of ashamed of myself for being upset with him because it was my doing. It was not his fault. And it's all about access. So, okay. I have a 16 year old. They have a smartphone. They have social media. They play video games. Like where do I even begin? I mean, I can't just go in and take it all away. Can I, what do I do? Yeah. Yeah, you can. And the 16 and 17, 18, it's hard. And depending on how dependent they are, it can be really tough and you have to be kind of careful if you think they're going to hurt you because we would tell Adam, we were going to call 911. Like I was so worried he was going to hurt the little kids because if the, the twins, if they went in there while he was gaming and it looked like they were going to touch his computer, he would just haul off and whack them, you know, and I had long. So, so it, it's a chemical reaction that they're having. They're having like, if you're a drug addict and someone tries to take your drug away, they will hurt you. So you have to kind of gauge where you are with that. It is not a behavioral thing that they're intending. It truly is their brain reaction. The amygdala is all screwed up. The amygdala is the warning center that tells them when danger, you know, and when they're on a video game, the amygdala is stimulated all the time. In fact, to the point where it gets worn out. And this is the whole problem with gaming addiction is that amygdala get so worn out that it can't protect them anymore. And so they're in the fight flight state all the time. And that's really scary when they're, when your kids are older and when like Adam, he was bigger than me and I was really scared of him. But if your child is just headed in this quicksand and you're trying to pull it back, you cannot do it in moderation. That's like just saying, well, I'm just going to give you a little cocaine, you know, 
no, it just doesn't work. Or how about we're just going to watch porn for an hour a day instead of three hours a day? I mean, it just doesn't work. And most of the physicians will say it has to be cold turkey. Um, we In our detox, we talk about cold turkey and we talk about how to do it. Okay, good. So I have so many questions. I know I could visit with you all day. I, I want to ask about, I want you to share your resources with us because you do give a lot of hope. None of this is new. To, no, you, no parent listening is in a situation that other parents have not been in. And this is what you do. You walk people through this. So we're going to talk about your new book and, and that. But before we do that, the last question I want to ask you is, is there a difference between first person shooter games and like if my kid is playing Mario Kart and also along with those lines, what if it is my spouse that is the one doing these games? Because I know that's the question rolling around <laughs> people's minds. Too. Last question is huge. And I'm trying to get more of our dads to come on and talk and on some podcasts, try to talk to dad one on one and explain what you're doing. Um, with a dad, you know, first of all, when they grew up, the games were not what they are today, especially like games like Pac-Man and like Mario Kart. You know, you had quarters, you're at the arcade, you run out of quarters, you're done, you get on your bike and you ride home. It's very different experience. Today, the games are so uh, immersive and the persuasive design is so strong. And there's a new book coming out really soon about that that I'll tell you about. But um, it's really fascinating to understand the behavioral science around this. And so it is not good for your kids to watch you play video games all night, just like it's not good for your kids to watch you get drunk. It's not good for your kids to watch other things that you might be doing. So there, you know, it's, it's so immersive and it's so addictive and men know this, they know, and, but it's fun and they have fun with it and whatnot, but it's really not, um, a hobby. It's not a real good uh, uh, play because it's you're actually inflicting harm on another person, even in your character. And so we have videos on our website from Lieutenant Colonel Grossman from the military that talks about that. And there is so much science on the aggression. So this is going to cause your child to be more aggressive. You have a brain that is 25 years old, at least probably. You're not going to have the same reaction that your kids will have. And while their brain is forming, that's what you're very concerned about. You don't want them to have all this aggression. You know, it may not be violence, but it's aggression. And it comes through in different areas. And we actually outline that in the book for the kids. Because one of the um, most uh, um, requested things that we have is, Melanie, can you explain this to my kids? Yes. And yes, we can. Mm -hmm. And what was, first of all, what was the second um, question? If my kids are going to play video games, would it be better for them to play something like Mario Kart versus a shooting game? The answer to that is you need to move away from giving video games as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they go to a cousin's house or a friend's house and it just kind of like is what it is. Sure. If it's just a random thing every now and then, you know, it's probably not a big deal. Although being burned like we were, it's just, we're done with it and we won't allow it. But what will happen with the Mario Kart over a few weeks, that is not going to be enough, right? Because if they're all designed for that dopamine to max out on Mario Kart. Now it's at this level. Okay. So now Mario Kart's not that fun because what happens with dopamine is your brain, um, gets the tolerance set up. And so now it's like, oh, well, that used to be really fun, but now it's not really fun. Just like Fortnite. Fortnite used to be really fun, but now I need to pay, play Call of Duty because okay. now that I need my next level of dopamine. So if you want to get on that roller coaster and fight that with your kid, it will be a fight. We got off the roller coaster. We decided we weren't going to fight about video games anymore. It will turn into a fight. I know very few situations where kids can play and walk away and act like it's no big deal. And they can like maybe right now when they're in fifth and sixth and seventh grade, but then when they hit eighth and ninth and 10th, it all changes. And this is the trick. So everybody listen, it's a trick that they don't tell you that your kids are changing. So your fifth grader may, you may trust your fifth grader and you may tell them don't click on this and don't do this. And, and, and they're going to be like, okay, mommy, I won't. But honey, let me tell you when they hit 15, they are going to use screens very differently and you're going to have a mess on your hands. Um, and I think this is a big trick. It's just one of those little parenting things that nobody tells you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, tell us about your new book because it looks so cool. Yeah. So this is kids brains and screens. And so we have a course for parents and we have all our material and our presentations are called kids brains and screens. And what I want to show you, um, well, here's the back of it and it has all the different chapters. So you can kind of see some of the, um, you know, you can see some of the graphics in here. Okay, I'll just show you one of the pages. So this is our graphic on dopamine 
And I've had so many doctors ask me, Melanie, can you make a, a poster of this? Because I <laughs> want to put this in my office. So we're explaining to your kid about dopamine. We're explaining to them about the addiction reward pathway and the cycle there. We have the whole first chapters about brain development. And we literally come in here and explain about neuronal pathways and why they need to do healthy activities. And then we go into the chapters on um, like physical things that are happening when you're on a screen, why you're going to be better physically, mentally, emotionally, and socially. We talk a lot about how to make friends because kids don't know how to do that anymore. And we have a whole section on empathy in here um, about what happens when you're bullied online. And if you can see the graphics are, this is kind of like a graphic novel, yeah. right? Yeah. So the kids love it. And so I am so thrilled over this. I cannot tell you um, how excited we are for this because now mom and dad, look, you, you don't have to do this all by yourself. And I'm not just saying this because this is my thing and I want to promote it. That's not it. This is everything that Adam and I wish we had known. And he helped me with this. He went through the material. And then our old one of our twins, um, also, well, both of them read through it, but one of them actually did a bunch of edits for me. So it would really fit the middle school brain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, we have everything that you need to teach your kids about screens. And we are not vilifying screens. We never say that screens are all bad. That's not it. But there are certain screen uses that are good and certain screen uses that are bad. And we have got to stop putting everything in one bucket. We can't, and we can't moderate the bad uses of screens. And this is very important to understand. And this is why this book really helps the kids understand why it's not healthy for them. And we take a, a very big scientific approach on it. So they're going to learn things in here that are really going to help them the whole rest of their life. I mean, my experience with our kids has been that uh, once they know the science and they understand for it, now all of a sudden they're advocating for it too. And they're like, oh, maybe we should tell our cousins about this and stuff, you yeah. know? No, they're going to start telling you to put your phone down. <laughs> <laughs> like they're really interested. Like when they know the why and the reasons behind it, like it, it really connects with them. So this gives them the why. So they will have the will to do the right thing. And, um, and we, I'm so excited. I'm just coming out of my skin about this because I have been doing this for almost 10 years and it was always hard for me to talk to little kids because I'm like, look, I've talked to parents. I'm going to tell parents all the things. So as we started developing this over like a three year period and I met and I did beta testing, we tested it with audiences and we tested it with milk. This is the best of the best. This is what we came up with and this works. So now you are the coach. You are the coach of your family. Now you have a game plan and you're going to share this with your kids and you're going to base your decisions and your rules off of this. And now, it, so you're not going to feel bad anymore. And, and I don't want you to think that your kids are going to hate you. And, you know, this is the fear that moms have. They're like, oh my gosh, my kids, they're not going to like me anymore. And my friends are all going to think that I'm weird and that I'm overprotecting my kids. Well, when you learn this and when you do our parent course as well, you understand that it is just the opposite. Your, your kids are going to love you and they're going to love it so much that you cared about them so much that, that you taught them about this and that you cared yes. enough to have these regulations in your home. In our house, we use Canopy as a filter. It's canopy.us. We found that to be the best on all the laptops and the phones and whatever. Our boys did not have smartphones. I have a rule personally that I will never buy a smartphone for a child. I don't care if you're 30 years old. I'm not buying you a phone. Um, and we just want to fill in during these young years, all these good things. So it's very positive. It's not about, Ooh, no, no, no. And we're mean. Our kids wouldn't trade it for anything. And on our podcast channel on 169 and on 179, the twins are on there talking about growing up without social media. Cool. And if you have kids right now, yeah. let's put that on. And by the way, get your kids on some pot and let, let them listen to podcasts. Totally. You know, we yes. love podcasts. Yeah. We love documentaries. We we use screens. We use technology for so many wonderful things in our house, but not those three toxic things. You can do it. Don't look back at what you've done and the mistakes that you made. Have that be your energy to move forward. And what you see when you start taking those three kinds of screens out of your house, you will get your kids back. You will have so much more fun 
with your it is so fun i can't even i hope that you can get a little piece of my excitement i'm so glad i second all of that and i you know people have said like oh teen years and i'm like i love the ages of our kids right now they're nine through four i'm like if i could freeze them at these ages like we're not fully in all the teen we have the most fascinating hilarious conversations the things they ask and come up with i mean and you would miss it if they were all playing Fortnite in the basement you would miss all that and and the one thing i want to and and I have so many things, but <laughs> it's only 48 months of high school. Like high school is only 48 months. And if we can't do something for 48 months, we've got bigger problems. <laughs> and this is what I used to tell the boys, because, you know, when eighth grade and sixth grade and seventh grade, they just knew that they were going to get a phone at Christmas. And I'm like, OK, I would just smile and we get over it. And then by the time they went to um, high school, it was like they were great being different. They were like, oh, this is really cool. Like, we don't have a phone. Everybody else does. But it's only 48 months of high school. And both of our boys, one of them was a student class president. The other was a senior class president. They didn't oh, miss a beat. Yeah. They had so many friends. Your kids will have way more friends. You, you will, We had the kids, we had their friends over at our house all the time, whether you're homeschooling, whether you're in regular school whatever, just have your house be the house. We have a a trademark thing, Friday fun night for a template for how to do this. That's included in here too. We have all the instructions in here. We have an escape room activity in the book for them to go through. It's an, a real, it's like an escape thing. And we have the seven day challenge in here. So we got everything you okay, need. Okay. So one last question then when kids come to your house with smartphones, cause we've experienced this, do they put them somewhere? Do they get set aside? Yeah, how do you manage we, we, Early on, I just told all the parents that my kids were allergic to social media and video games and we would laugh and I would say, yeah, and they're allergic to porn and we kind of laugh and I'd say, so just don't, your kids just can't bring that stuff in the house right now. And and I would say, you know, I know y'all got figured out. I screwed up my oldest kid. <laughs> I, I don't know how to manage, you know, having eight boys over if they have smartphones and the moms would usually honor that. You can keep them in a basket at the front. That was more awkward to me than just tell them they just couldn't bring them in the house. And so our house became the house where they they played outside all the time. They rode their bikes all the time. They had a longboard club. They have T-shirts they made while the neighborhood kids like it became we didn't do screens like that was lame. That was kind of meh. You know, we just kind of did so many more things. And I will just say at first it is hard, mom, it will be hard. You will have to structure some things depending on how old your kids are. But it very quickly gets past that very quickly. They become the agents of that change and they find out, oh my gosh, this is so much more fun than hanging on Fortnite. This is so much more fun. We have pizza nights at our house all the time. I get pizza from the grocery because I don't like to make pizza dough and they make all their own pizzas. Like, yeah. I mean, that is, I mean, who does that anymore, right? So they just have a lot of fun. And But yes, it is a problem. Do not let other kids bring, um, you know, and if your kids were allergic to peanuts, you wouldn't let them be around peanuts. So think about it like an allergy right? It makes you like get that backbone, like, oh my gosh, I don't want them in the ER. So, and you know what, what if we're all wrong, Don? What if, what if I'm wrong? No parent has ever looked back and said, oh, dang it. I wish my kids had played more Fortnite when they were in high school. Right. Or I wish they'd been on social it's media. Yeah. We're not ever going to look back yeah, and that's say so that. Good. This has been really, it did start out a little heavy, but very encouraging. It, I did just think of one other thing. I'm going to link to a great video I found about how to teach your young kids to play on their own, because that's the fear, uh, especially if we work from home of like, they're going to need me to facilitate all their play. Good news. You can fully uh, teach your kids how to occupy themselves uh, for up to like three hours at a time. I do not like my kids, like they would just play. I had to work and all that. Like, um, so that's the best gift too. you can ever give your kid. Yeah. And we have a whole section on here on boredom and how to do that. Oh, good. Yeah. And I would also recommend that look into, even if you can't afford it, figure out a way to afford some music lessons. Piano is the best because it goes on forever. Any kind of music, anything they can do, um, sports, you know, art lesson, anything like that, do what you can to invest in your kids right now in these types of activities and it will pay off. And remember, you don't, they don't need social media. They will be fine. They will know exactly how to use it when their brain is older. They will not be left out. They will be leaders. They will be ahead of the crowd and they will thrive in a, in a way you'll be so thankful. So I hope that everybody, um, could really take advantage from our situation with our first and um, screenstrong.org is the organization. Awesome. 
Well, yeah, we will link to all of these resources. It's so important. And you are a great follow on Instagram. It's just good reminders. You know, we kind of need the reminders like, wait, why am I doing this <laughs> again? So no, you need a reminder like every day, if not every week, every day, whatever. And you got to get a community. And so our formula is education. You have to get educated and you have to get a community. And we have a forum that's not social media in our group. We also have that social media, but we have a forum on our website. And what I, what I would say to the call to action is, is to get this book, get five of your friend, mom friends together. Everybody go through this like a book club, right? And then you do it with your kids because you'll learn a lot in this book. This is like for parents too. We have a parent course, but this you'll learn a lot. And then you want to start your little group and you want to start your little screen strong group. And you're not going to worry what anybody else says. And if three of them drop out, that's okay. You'll still have one more left. Your kid just needs one more friend. They just need one more friend to do this with them. And as they get to be 16, 15, 16, then they don't care as yeah. much about it. Yeah, that's um, so good. You got to get them through those middle school years. Yeah. Thank you, Melanie. This is awesome. And I hope we can visit again in the future. Thank you for joining us on the Minimal Mom Podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend who might find value in embracing a simplified lifestyle.